tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I'm your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. And today we're speaking with Dr. Savannah Howes and R.J. Baylot. Dr. Savannah is a Metis veterinarian from a small town in Alberta. She graduated from the UCVM in 2013 and has been in rural mixed practice in Drayton Valley, Alberta since then. Dr. Savannah has volunteered with the Canadian Animal Task Force for 10 years, serving as their responsible veterinarian for the past six years. She volunteers with Alberta Helping Animal Society as a board member veterinarian and volunteer surgeon. Through this organization, she also participates in a Northern Outreach Program to provide wellness veterinary services in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. She has previously been a radio show host on 630 CHED's Pet Talk, as well as starred in a recent television series called Dr. Savannah Howes, Wild Rose Vet, airing on Aboriginal People's Television Network and Cottage Life. She's a member of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee with the Alberta Veterinary Medical Association. And in between working and volunteering, Savannah spends entirely too much time playing video games and reading about hikes that she probably isn't fit enough to go on. Oh my, I can sympathize with that. And then we have R.J. Baylot, the Executive Director of Canadian Animal Task Force. R.J. resides in Calgary, Alberta. He's a co-founder and executive director of the Canadian Animal Task Force. The Canadian Animal Task Force is a volunteer-based group that works with First Nations and rural communities to assist with their community approach to reducing human health issues that have resulted from pet overpopulation and to improve the health and well-being of the dogs and cats in their community. The goal of the task force is to create a safe and caring environment for all living creatures. RJ has traveled nationally and internationally to many animal protection groups' home bases to study and accumulate knowledge and ideas to accommodate better groups in animal rescue protection and education. RJ, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Yeah, thank you so much. So before we jump over to Dr. Savannah, RJ, let me know, how'd you become so passionate about cats? Well, I've always been passionate about all animals, but cats in particular, it just became a natural passion of mine because cats were often, at least I felt, the underdog really in the animal welfare sector. That dogs, you know, were usually highlighted in most platforms um, and programs, and the cats seemed to be the ones that often went without getting the support they needed, especially feral cats. So that really is what drew me to my passion for cats. And Dr. Savannah, what is your passion story? Well, I've always loved cats and we've always owned cats. I've had them as pets. And I also grew up in a rural community. And growing up, it was always common to see way too many cats on the farms. And some of the so-called accepted practices of dealing with the cats, it was very prevalent And it just never really sat right with me that that was the only answer. So when I graduated from veterinary school and started working in rural areas, I could see that those common ways of getting rid of cats, namely things like more violent uh, removal of cats, euthanizing cats, that kind of thing. I found that it wasn't because the people I grew up with were mean to cats or hated cats. It was because they really didn't have any alternatives. And so being able to work with an organization and develop programs that helps to address these problems in a way that is more productive and more humane for everyone involved is fulfilling for me. So when you say no alternatives in the communities that you work with, what sort of services are you referring to? No access to spay neuter services or is there more to that? Yeah, it's that's only one facet of the whole picture. So Things like uh, access to veterinary care is a big one, particularly in rural communities. I know growing up, you would have to drive 45 minutes to an hour just to get to the nearest veterinary clinic, and we weren't even that rural. So access to care, access to veterinary preventative care, spay and neuter procedures, 
but also networks to rehome cats that may be unwanted in a particular area or would do better in a different home. That's another example. And I don't think anybody really even knew that they could ask for help about these things. So I think it's really cool that we get to work in these communities and show them that there are different ways that we can go about managing these problems. So RJ, can you expand a little bit more about what the Canadian Animal Task Force does and how it applies to cats? Sure. So the Canadian Animal Task Force, when we started, our primary program was working in First Nation communities and setting up these large-scale on-site spay and neuter wellness clinics. And over the years, our programs have expanded to include municipal and rural cats. So we do a very similar program in that we set up the ad hoc clinic in a community and we'll actually trap the cats in the community and do surgery at a temporary site before they get released. And unfortunately, I don't have much involvement with community cats in Canada. We have a lot of groups that attend our webinars and people who tune in. So is there a way for you to give me a sense of how urgent is the situation with community cats? I believe there was a documentary that was produced at one point that really Canada is the same as the, as the United States. There's just, there is a cat overpopulation. I hate to say this. I hate to use this word, cat overpopulation problem, but I don't know how to phrase it in another way. Are those challenges present in Canada too, RJ? Absolutely, they are. Sadly, I see the cat issue being across the world. It's not just restricted to Canada and the U.S. And where we are in Alberta, it gets quite cold in the winter. So the cats that are outside to fend for themselves are not only just fending for basic survival, but have to get through this cold weather. So we get a ton of requests from municipalities reaching out for help, which is great because we're excited that communities are looking at these more sustainable, humane programs. But we're also, our resources are are stretched quite thin. So unfortunately, we're not able to always attend in every community that wants us to come out. Right. And my understanding also is from a private practice standpoint, the cost to get a cat spayed or neutered is probably higher in Canada than we even see in the U.S. Is that true, RJ, what you see? That's right. So we see prices, they fluctuate and they can get quite high. And when you think of someone who is in a rural situation, Let's say you just moved into a new property and with that property came five or 10 feral cats. Well, the cost to do five or 10 cats is exponential, but then there's also the logistics on how are you going to capture those cats? Which clinic is going to be able to accommodate all of those cats? So there's several logistics that sometimes are barriers for people to actually have their cats spayed or neutered. Yeah. It sounds like it's very challenging on a variety of levels and One of the other things I hate hearing about is during the wintertime, survival rates for kittens, especially in the cold parts of the country. I think that is one of the reasons why, you know, the southern United States has a higher cat population problem, or it seems that way, is because the winters are so hard, especially for the younger cats to make it through the winter. Dr. Savannah, I want to ask you, what are the things that you see? You talked about you have a program that goes out into the First Nations communities. And, you know, the challenges that you are faced with, with cat overpopulation, as well as trying to serve the needs of the community in general, and you're strapped so thin. So how do you balance it all without feeling overwhelmed? That's a great question. And I would say there's many a day where we aren't successful with not feeling overwhelmed, (laughs) to be perfectly candid. But really, part of it is that When I'm feeling overwhelmed, the way that I'll ground myself and the way that I kind of bring myself real things back in is I think about the fact that even helping a single family, just helping out a single person, even just doing a handful of cats, say even like five to 10 at one property, which is small compared to some of the places we've been to, even just helping out that one person. I think is extremely rewarding. And to that person, we've made a world of difference. And I think RJ would be able to speak on this further. We've had some people that reach out to us and comment to us afterwards just about the sheer relief they feel that somebody's been able to help them. Isn't that so, RJ? Yeah, we hear that often where people just feel like there's a weight lifted. So they're not panicking, trying to find homes for kittens. They're able to care for and maintain the animals that they're currently providing care for. So it just improves our quality of life. You know, sometimes people are a little bit reluctant 
because they may not have a relationship yet with our organization. But as soon as we build that relationship and trust and they see the outcome, it is extremely rewarding, like you said. So RJ, you talk about building relationships and trust. What are your tips for actually doing that? We've heard of a lot of different varieties of approaching. Say there's a community, we know that they've got a lot of cat issues. And in the past, organizations would come in, they would do things, and then they would leave. And I think now we're trying to be more integrated and embedded and trying to support existing systems in the community to be able to provide the necessary resources and support or collaborate, be more embedded in that community. Is, is that something that you're striving to do? Absolutely. It's so important in all of this. We, I think this is an issue everywhere in that no matter which community you're in, there's going to be people on both sides of the fence when it comes to the cat situation. And then you're going to have people in the community who've already been either trapping cats, feeding cats, rescuing So it's so important that all those people are brought to the table. You might have to meet in the middle, but it's so important that everyone's part of this process because it doesn't work unless everyone's at the table. Because if everyone's kind of doing something on their own and there's no cohesiveness, it's not going to be sustainable. So we always tie in all the individuals or groups who've already been doing stuff in the community. We're coming in from outside the community. So what we're doing is just having an immediate impact but it's not having that long impact. That long-term impact really has to come from the ongoing involvement of the community. Would you like to help pet parents and their beloved pets? Pet parents in the Ticonderoga, New York area need your help. The area has few resources, but the Keeping People and Pets Together Pet Food Pantry is trying to fill that void. They provide pet parents with food and supplies as well as low-cost spay-neuter. They need donations and volunteers. To help, go to the Keeping People and Pets Together Pet Food Pantry on Facebook or email one at a time, 09 at gmail.com. Want an easy grant opportunity for your animal organization? Maddie's Fund is giving away a $3,000 grant each month to one lucky Maddie's Pet Forum member. You'll automatically be entered to win each month when you start a new discussion, reply to a new post, or upload a new library resource. Learn more at forum.maddiesfund.org today. Tomahawk Live Trap exceeds customers' expectations by providing them with the highest quality humane animal control products available. Check out their new Pro Series Gravity Door Trap. They feature a door that sets automatically when you open it. No hook or plate setting needed. Use discount code KEEPITHUMANE for 10% off your order at livetrap.com. Are you a proud cat parent looking for the perfect, affordable health care for your kitty? Well, look no further than the Community Cat Clinic, conveniently located in Woodstock, Georgia, just north of Atlanta and not too far from the Tennessee and South Carolina borders. The health and happiness of all cats are the top priorities at this feline-only hospital. From preventative care, spay, neuter, and vaccines to specialized and innovative treatments like full mouth dental, ultrasound, radio, iodine therapy, emergency blockage cases. They got your cat's well-being covered. For the TNR community and local shelters, they offer easy to access low-cost spay neuter services and volume appointments. So if you want to do a large TNR project, this is the clinic you want to go to. It's worth the extra trip. Appointments are available most days. Check out the Community Cat Clinic online at communitycatclinic.com or visit them in person at the Walmart Shopping Center at the Shops of Trickham on Highway 92 at Trickham Road in Woodstock, Georgia. More per, less price. There's that extra front-loaded support, and then there is providing enough resources to the community to maintain the success that you have had. So if you go in and you do a a MASH-style clinic, and you do, I don't know, 400 cats or whatever, then there's a certain level of continuing that you're going to have to do. So that community is going to have to have a certain goal of spay, neuter. In my mind, I talk about spay, neuter all the time because population is such an issue for cats. So spay, neuter appointment support in that community to be able to maintain where they are and not slide backward and make that front loading not valuable, you know, impactful to the community. So 
it's a two pronged approach, really. Would you agree with that, RJ? Yes, absolutely. There needs to be that ongoing follow up after kind of quote unquote that intervention of us going in and doing a large scale spay neuter clinic. We really need those local trappers and rescuers and and caregivers to uh, continue on. Dr. Savannah, I'm going to make an assumption, but you can share with me if I am wrong. I would assume that you practice as a high quality, high volume spay neuter veterinarian. I actually don't. So I'm practicing as a rural mixed animal practitioner. Do you know of veterinarians that serve this purpose out in the rural communities, like when they come out for special events? Uh, I know in the United States, I'm part of the United Spay Alliance. I'm on their board of directors. And, you know, it's really important. We're trying to get training programs in every state to be able to train any veterinarian that wants to know how to do high quality, high volume spay neuter techniques so that then it's a tool of the toolbox that they have that they can kind of pull out at any point in time. Um, Is there such a campaign in the areas that you work in? I really wish that there was. I truly do. I really admire the work that the Humane Alliance does and how they go about things. I know there's lots of other continuing education available, particularly in the U.S., but in Canada, it's not as common. We don't have, we certainly do have some excellent high volume, high quality spay neuter surgeons, but not nearly as many as in the United States. And this potential lack of, I don't want to say lack of training, but this lack of opportunity to pick up these additional skills, I think it has a big impact on accessibility to veterinary care because many veterinary clinics are not comfortable working with feral cats. Many of them are not trained in high volume, high quality spay neuter techniques. And so that's a huge limiting factor as to why even if somebody had all the money in the world, there's simply not enough people to do the job in our province. And so I think having something set up like that would be phenomenal. And who knows, maybe 10, 20 years from now, we'll have a really robust program. But I think that that's another aspect to this access to veterinary care that's holding us back in some of these ways. Yeah. So I actually am also thrilled to be involved with the Community Cat Clinic, which is a for-profit clinic that's operating down in Georgia. And it's trying to meld the components from the high volume, high quality spay neuter model, along with private practice, along with affordability and accessibility. And so one of the important components that we had was a trap room in the back with a keypad. So the trappers could bring the cats in at two o'clock in the morning and drop them off and then pick them up after surgery the next day. So they weren't dependent on work hours. Uh, and that, so it was bringing some of those, what we would consider sort of a nonprofit animal welfare component into a for-profit veterinary space that covers all aspects of cat. And that's obviously it's a cat-only clinic model. So the hope is that that will spread far and wide because I think it's important that, you know, we have, we have a one health model, but I also think we need a one cat model where We're trying to bring the stories together of all cats. We're all cat, but there's a wide range of how we treat our cats. And let's bring it, try to bring it together. And I understand in rural areas, it's a different type of model than what we see in urban areas. But if we do this in urban areas too, people will be like, well, what's that? What are those traps all about? And it's an educational component and it's integrating the different layers of cat together in in one place. And so I, I really hope that, yeah, 10 years from now, I hope that, We have models like these that are kind of spread around the country and lots of training and open communication amongst veterinarians to be able to talk about these things. And there there is a veterinary shortage in the United States. Dr. Savannah, is there a veterinary and technician shortage also in Canada? Yes, absolutely. In both urban and rural spaces. And one feature of Canada that might be a little different for your American uh, listeners, unless they're from Alaska. Um, is that our population density, once you get beyond a certain parallel, is so small, like it's so low for an idea of scale or accessibility of care. The entire territory of Nunavut does not have a single permanent veterinarian there. And there's literally two veterinary clinics in the Northwest Territories, and they're both in Yellowknife. And even in in Alberta, we're all concentrated closer to the southern part of the province. As soon as you go north of Edmonton, 
it's very sparse how many clinics are even there. So it's quite remote in a lot of the places we go to. And in many places, we're the only veterinary care that's available. Oh, yeah. So you are a critical resource, definitely, in those areas, for sure. And I know you talked about going into the First Nations communities. Is it a MASH style? Do you go in with your van and you schedule, I'll be here on the third Thursday every month? Is that how it works? We actually drive out with two large trailers full of equipment and we'll set up in a gymnasium or in a school and we'll actually have upwards to 13 surgery tables. So we'll set up over the course of two and a half days and we'll see upwards to 600 animals in that time. So we've done upwards of 550 surgeries in two and a half days. And then, but we're also doing uh, vaccines and treating them with parasites. And then of course, providing them with permanent identification. So you say, RJ, you say permanent identification. Is that microchipping or is that something else? Yeah, so we use tattoos in our programs and we do that because there's multiple volunteers throughout the province that are working with different organizations in the communities that we also work in. So the tattoos are just a quick visual. Then people know, oh, this is one of the task force tattoos. They could text us and we could provide owner information if they need. The microchips are great. It's just that because there's so many people out in the field, they don't always have wands with them that the, the tattoo is just that quick and easy visual. Right. No, the scanners are expensive. They're hard to come by at times. I do have a I have a dream too about having our local libraries have scanners as a loaner because I think that would be a helpful resource in preventing cats being surrendered. Again, probably more for the urban and suburban areas, but it's another tool for people to use to prevent having to bring cats into shelters as well as make a vet appointment to bring a cat in to be scanned. I mean, that's not a, a high use of anybody's time. So it would be ideal to be able to use a scanner from the library and then return it after you've scanned the cat to make sure that it's not owned by anybody. But again, microchips have to be used. We've been using microchips here probably for oh almost 18 years. So the shelters have pretty commonly been doing microchipping for a, a quite a long time. RJ, if folks are interested in finding out more about the work that you and your team are doing at the Canadian Animal Task Force, how would they do that? Yeah. So if anyone's interested to volunteer or to support us, or if they're looking for help in their community in relation to their cats, then you go to our website at cataskforce.org and we have a list of our programs there or volunteer opportunities. So that's usually your best place or on our Facebook page. We try to put regular posts on there to let people know what we're doing, where we're going to be. And RJ, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Yeah, you know, I think that especially when looking at cat programs, it, it can be daunting, like you said earlier on. And it's so important to have a starting point. When we started, it was really small. We only had a couple cat traps. Now we travel with about 150 cat traps. But it took years for us to get to this stage. But what we knew from the beginning was it was really important, even being small, that we're focusing in on a population of animals. So rather than spreading yourself too thin, focus on one group of cats and have that 100% goal of sterilization in the population so that you're having that impact. And if you don't have the ability to set up an on-site clinic like what we're doing, to have a system in place that is easier for the local vet clinics that you're working with so that they're more inclined to support your program. For example, we keep all the cats in traps and we have them weed in the traps. And so that this way, when we bring them to a clinic, the clinic already knows how much they weigh. They get sedated in their trap, they recover in their trap, and then they come back to the organization. So it's a lot less handling and just a faster process for them. And we find that clinics are more inclined to get involved when it's simplified because we know how busy everyone is. So just, I guess, start small, but have these goals and not to, to take on more than you can. And in addition to the tattooing, RJ, are you also ear tipping the cats? We are. For feral cats or for the community cat program, we are tipping the ear. Sadly, in Canada, again, with this, well, you would see this too in, in many of the states with the snow, we do see cats who have frostbitten ear, so they do lose a piece of their ear. So we do uh, tattoo in one ear, the ear tip in the other, 
and we just hope that their little ears stay warm through the winter. Dr. Savannah, is there anything you'd like to share with folks before we close out? I would like to share that the uh, community building aspect of this is is so key. And I know that's, I think, a, a large part of our success is the fact that we willingly work with multiple groups. So we're working with SPCAs and humane societies. We're working with privately run rescue groups. We're working with, we'll have First Nations community liaison in each of the First Nations we work with. So we're working directly with bands and councils. And we're working with municipalities, like the governments and everything. So I think that interconnectedness is really what allows us to really have the impact that we do. And we just can't emphasize enough how important that relationship building is. And if you are working with First Nations communities, it's really an act of reconciliation to build those kinds of relationships and work with them as well. So there's just a lot of good that can be done when we work with people instead of trying to forge our own path by ourselves. Dr. Savannah and RJ, I'd like to thank you both for joining me today and being guests on the show. And I hope we'll have you on again in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you for having us. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think. And a five-star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening, and thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats.